what is the point of Prince Harry's memoir? Hello everyone, welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany and today we are talking about the catastrophic train wreck that is Prince Harry's memoir release. But in addition, the real thing is, is as all these leaks come across, I was really expecting Harry, I knew he would go down the victim narrative, but I was also expecting a memoir that made him look somewhat good, some guy who could make decent decisions, a, a hero, a war hero, and all these sorts of things. But as I'm reading through all these excerpts, what really comes across to me entirely about this book is that Harry sounds rather dumb and dim. And in addition, not only does he sound that way, but Megan does too. And I'm wondering to myself, why in the world did you guys write this thing that I think is a legitimate competition between who's dumber, Harry for writing the memoir that makes him look terrible, and Meghan Markle for letting him write a memoir where he looks terrible and she looks terrible. It really is quite an interesting question. I'm flummoxed, I don't know what to think. And honestly, I don't want to use that kind of language, saying somebody is dumb or something like that, but I think it is important to recognize it and and bear out that these people have been hammering and telling us how great and fantastic they are all the time and how they're wonderful and amazing, that everything about them is untrue. Everything about them is untrue. That they hold the truth, that they hold the cards. But yeah, as I read through the memoir, some of what they, I'm sure, are not wanting us to get is they kind of confirm a lot of the rumors about themselves. They confirm a lot of the rumors about Meghan Markle's behavior and the royal's reaction to it, that they were very frustrated, upset, and angry with how she was treating staff members, which was completely outside of what royals are supposed to do. And they tried to address it. And then they tried to address things with Harry multiple times. And how Harry and Meghan didn't take any of the advice, didn't take any of the well-intentioned questions that the other royals were asking. And at the end of the day, I just can't help but think that Harry and Meghan come across as the dullards in this. I'm sure they were hoping that we would all be against the monarchy and that we would all be for them, but no, just broadly, Harry and Meghan are turning the world off of them. So even the whole project itself, you could say, reveals the stupidity of their decisions for the last couple of years. It's fascinating to see. So that is what we are gonna talk about today. I have about 17 examples from the book, about 17, I, I counted, but when I filmed the video, I didn't count one by one. Maybe I should start doing that. Let me know if you want me to start doing that. And I'm gonna tell with you guys what I think are some of the dumbest things in the book, things that are obviously easily disputable, that make them look like targets in specific instance of Harry's tour in Afghanistan, or that just generally confirms rumors that we've heard time and time again that Harry and Meghan have told us are false, and yet they seemingly 100% confirm them, or just general human behavior things that Harry and Meghan, it's a mystery to them. It's a mystery to them why people wouldn't want somebody hugging them who they don't know. It's, it's an absolute mystery to them. And I honestly did film a different intro earlier, but I just decided to change up my language a bit. So without further ado, let's get back to the main video. So guys, if you haven't been here to Royal News Network before, like I said, my name is Brittany, and on this channel I provide compelling royal commentary on the latest royal news and sometimes a little bit of gossip too. I will be also reviewing television shows and movies and sharing a bit about history as well. So if you guys wanna subscribe, that would be absolutely fantastic. In addition, I also have a fashion channel, Royal Fashion News, and I also have a newsletter, Royal Wire. So if you guys are interested in that, feel free to head over. I have links in the description box down below for all those little things. And I just wanted to say, first, off a big shout out to King Constantine of Greece. So apparently he is in quite dire health straits right now. And so all of his family is gathering in Athens to see him. And so just prayers out to him and his family during this difficult time. All right, guys. So I gathered 17 little tidbits and stories that we've heard, at least 17. I may, I may go more as, as I think of things because honestly, this has been different than other book reviews. So for example, Tom Bauer, I got, we were, we got snippets of his and so they were, they were in some sort of order. This is just chaos incarnate. It's just a deluge of random pieces of information. So at some points when I'm researching or grabbing something for another story, another tidbit and piece may come to mind. But so far I have a list of 17 different areas where Harry and Meghan share these stories, which are, I guess, supposed to make them look good or supposed to, 
I'm not sure make the monarchy look bad, but in fact, the exact opposite is happening is that Harry and Meghan look the fools at the end of the day. Okay, so number one story we'll go into is the whole thing about the uniform that Harry wore of a particular German army that was founded in the 1930s. And so Harry wore this uniform to a party. And what he is claiming is that he called and phoned or asked Catherine and William, which costume should he wear? The pilot's uniform or the German uniform? And Catherine and William said the German uniform, he alleges. Now, perhaps that isn't what happened, but I'm just going off the basis of what Harry said, because actually, again, what he said does not make him look good. So number one, why even ask? Harry, why was this even a question in your mind whether to wear the pilot uniform or the German uniform? The pilot uniform should be so exceedingly obvious that you even question that makes me question your intelligence. But it gets worse, I feel like, because let's say Catherine and William did tell him, hey, wear that uniform. I think what they were doing is that they were actually playing somewhat of a joke on him. So I will play a little bit of this clip here and there, but this is a clip from Friends where Joey is trying to figure out what his stage name should be. And they're talking about it and they're discussing it. And Chandler goes, well, what about, he's like, Joe Stalin? And he, he laughs. And Joey's like, yeah. And Chandler, you can see his eyes. He, he, he knows it. So take a listen here. Joe, 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 Stalin? <laughs> Stalin. <laughs> Stalin. Do I know that name? That sounds familiar. Well, it does not ring a bell with me. <laughs> okay, so I am breaking this up for copyright issues, so... You, you see it, Chandler is completely in on the fact that Joey has no idea who Joseph Stalin is. No, no clue whatsoever. So he goes on and he, he starts agreeing and they're like, yeah, yeah. And so go ahead and take a watch here. Joe Stalin. <laughs> you know, that's pretty good. You might want to try Joseph. <laughs> All right, and I think if I have one more clip, I'll insert it right here. Joseph Stalin. I think you'd remember that. Oh, yes. <laughs> bye Bye Birdie, starring Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin is the fiddler on the roof. If you look at that whole thing, what it tells me very clearly is that Chandler knew that jo who Joseph Stalin was and knew Joey didn't know. So he's playing a joke on Joey. So it could be that Catherine and William said yes to the German uniform to play a joke on Harry, thinking that he would be smart enough to understand the sarcasm, to understand the influences, and just to be intelligent enough to know he should not wear a Nazi uniform. And he didn't. So I feel like this makes Harry look, frankly, dumb in this entire interaction. There was either a joke he wasn't in on, there was, he was still stupid, too stupid apparently to know that he shouldn't wear that uniform regardless of anything else and that he even had that as an option. And although we don't know the full context of the story, the idea is that Harry is blaming William for doing this and for Harry getting the backlash. But Harry, the only person who actually wore the uniform was yourself. So whether it was a joke, whether they were serious, whether what, what have you, you made the choice to wear the uniform. So I feel like in that instance, Harry trying to flip this, trying to, to skirt blame a bit and trying to say, well, they told me this. I was like, well, you don't have to take their advice. If everybody goes to a bridge and is jumping off, will you do the same thing? No. So why are you saying you were going to go with the mob? Like this should have been so exceedingly like basic level common sense that Harry didn't seem to understand it. It's just really, really a bit of concerning, needless to say, and just doesn't make him sound good. Okay, next we have this story that I feel like to me is the cringiest of the bunch. And it's Meghan Markle asking her future sister-in-law, at that time, the Duchess of Cambridge, hey, can I borrow your lip gloss right before we go on stage at an event? And Catherine's like, sure, sure, I guess, I, I, I guess. And I feel like this was played off on as a way to say, well, Catherine's cold. She didn't want to share her lip gloss, which would have probably been this Clarence. So she actually was pictured wearing this. Oops, I got it. Clarence, natural lip perfector. 
here. So I will just show it to you. It's really easy. I've actually did this. Oops. I actually grabbed this before because it's really easy. So you put it up, you see it like that, and it has a little, and then you squeeze, and a little bit of ink comes out. So that is it. So this is in the color one, and then you just, you know, you get a little bit on the tip, and you just, it just gives your lips a little bit of gloss. So it's kind of nice, especially if you perhaps maybe need some color or something. This would be nice. But here's the weird thing. Megan asked Catherine for this. Catherine was pregnant. Catherine was pregnant. And you don't know where somebody's lips have been. Now, to, to add further context, Megan apparently put it on her hand and then put it on her lips. But still, you don't know where the back of somebody's hand has been. And it's, just, or their fingers. She touched it, you know, she had to touch the thing with her fingers. So it's like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It makes you seem so unprofessional that you weren't, you didn't have things together enough to have a lip gloss on hand. In addition, I just think it's rude, it's presumptive, it's privileged. I don't know. It's just a whole bunch of things to go, hey, I want to have, I want to steal your lip gloss because I didn't bring mine. And it's one thing I feel like for family members to share, like immediate family members. So I could see perhaps Pippa or Catherine actually perhaps sharing something like this, but not somebody you hardly know. And what really irritated me about the whole thing is that Harry said, well, it's an American thing. I'm like, no, it's not. It is not an American thing to ask for somebody else's lip gloss. What, what is Harry talking about? It's not an American thing. It's a crazy Meghan Markle thing. That's the only reason, that's the only conclusion you can make. Cause I would never ever, even a very, very close friend probably ever share something like this with them. It's a hygiene thing. It's a safety thing. Like you don't share eye makeup. You don't share lip makeup. And so even if you go to the mall and you get a, a makeup look done, the artist actually sticks up the tube and then grabs them off the top with a brush and then puts it on your lips. They don't put it directly on your lips. That it really, really ever, ever happens. Just because it's not safe, it's unhygienic. So Harry going, well, it's an American thing. No, it's not. Absolutely not. And Megan also looks awful for asking for such a thing, which I feel like is absolutely ridiculous. Why in the world would you ask somebody for something like this? Um, and if you guys are curious, I will link this down below if you would like it. It's Clarins. Trying some of their stuff. We'll see if it works. Because I was just at Ulta and I was like, oh, that would be fun. Next one is Harry not telling Megan how to greet William for the first time. So it's their first meeting. And Meghan Markle is a stage four hugger. She will hug anything that moves. And so apparently Harry had told Meghan that sometimes in certain situations, yes, you should curtsy to him. But right now it's just casual. So you can just you can just go up and do her stage four hugging, clean, clean, clean hugging thing. And of course she did that and William was sort of repulsed by it. And I, as I understand it, and somebody did say it in the comments, is Brits are not really huggers in the way some Americans are. Not all Americans, by the way. Crazy Americans like Megan, apparently. Again, the stage four hugger classification for Megan. But most Brits are more, you know, they do the kiss on the cheek thing. They don't really hug the same way. It's just a different way of interacting personally, which is a cultural difference. And so if you are in a different culture, you don't barrel through and go, well, this is what I do and everybody should conform to me. No, smart, intelligent people go, okay, well, tell me how you would normally, how my, I would normally introduce myself to him. Because Harry was like, oh, this is casual. So you, you don't have to do that. But it's like, but did Harry tell Willi William that? Because it doesn't seem like he did. And William was expecting the deference that should be paid to him as somebody who's potentially mirroring into this hierarchical institution. Yes, it's archaic. Yes, it's something that Meghan and Harry probably don't want to do all the time. But that is what is required of you. That is what re is required of you in that role. So Harry should have told Megan, okay, right now, this may sound crazy. Go ahead and curtsy to him. Once you get to know him, that probably just, we won't do that anymore, but we need to establish a good precedence right now because Megan just being sloppy and slovenly and uncultured and brash is not going to go down well. And again, this makes both Harry and Megan look dumb. Harry looking dumb for not telling Megan really explaining to her what the protocol requires because he's like, oh, it's just William, which I understand, but he should have asked 
William. He shouldn't have just assumed that William would want to be, you know, manhandled by Meghan Markle, who's desperate for a hug. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and Meghan should have been cultured enough because we've been told she has a degree in international relations. She spent time at the embassy in Argentina. She should have enough sense to know, hey, what do you guys normally do? How do you guys normally interact? Please, I want to make sure I put my best foot forward. So I, I do think Harry's kind of the idiot for not explaining things to her well, but yet she's also, I feel like at fault somewhat for not trying to do more. Because here's the thing for me with Meghan. Meghan was in her mid 30s when she started this, mid 30s. Harry was in his 30s as well. They're not 21. If Harry was, tw let's say, 23, Megan was tw 24 because, you know, she's older than him or 27. I'm sorry, no. If Harry was 16 and Megan was 21, that sounds a little, let's say Harry was 18 and Megan was 24. Granted, she, she's come to some maturity, but your brain doesn't start is, isn't done forming until you're 25. And at 24, you still have a decent amount of life experience to get through. So I could understand that perhaps they don't know what the protocol requires or that they're not following it. Megan is in her mid thirties. We've been told she is a professional woman. She's an international traveler, yet she cannot do diddly squat when it comes to this. And to me, that just screams that she is either like unbelievably arrogant and narcissistic, which I feel like to a certain extent is true, but also that she looks dumb. She looks like she's somebody who doesn't care about understanding her husband's culture and really trying to integrate into the family. She just looks like, well, I do things my way, so I don't need to learn what you guys do. <laughs> That's beneath me. Again, horrible way to go about things, especially when you're meeting your future in-laws. And obviously, it didn't go well. All right, next is that Megan is a stage four hugger. She will hug anybody that moves and she will cling to them because Megan has never met a stranger she couldn't hug. She's never met a stranger that she couldn't hug. But again, it goes back to this thing that I was talking about earlier. It's a understanding that other people have different cultural values. So for example, if I was in the UK, I probably wouldn't hug a close friend. I kiss them on the cheek because that's what they do or not the kiss on the cheek, but you know, the, the thing I'd amend my practices because I am in another culture. Megan did not care, and you get the sense a lot, Megan did not care to amend herself at all. She did not care to amend herself at all. Now granted, if Harry was coming to the States and he was the outside, yes, you would adopt more American customs, which is what they've done now. But when Megan went to the UK, as a person of intelligence, as we've been told multiple times, and as a person of education, as a person who has had a professional career, she should have known, hey, I need to adjust myself, not be the stage four hugger, not attack people with what I'm trying to portray as warmth and try to understand their boundaries and their sense of personal space. Megan violated Catherine and William's sense of personal space by attempting to hug them and glom onto them when that was something that was not comfortable for them. And that's something that's just basic intelligence as a full grown adult, which Megan was when she married Harry, when she started dating Harry, she was not this young thing. If she was this young thing, let's say Harry was 10 years younger than William, William and Catherine, I felt like would have given her a pass, would have said, okay, she's just young. He's young. They don't know what to do. I'm sure William and Catherine were like, Harry knows what to do. Megan is, is older than us. She should know what to do. That Harry and Megan didn't, that they didn't even try to amend themselves, that, that Harry didn't say, hey, you need to, you need to somewhat change this up is like ridiculous in my mind. And I don't think I mentioned this on my list, but we do have a quote where Megan said about the queen, I love meeting grandmas. I love grandmas. That's what she said. Yay, I love grandmas when she told she was gonna meet the queen. It's like zero respect, zero respect for meeting the queen of England. Absolutely zero. She is so brash. She is the worst type of stereotype for an American. It's so aggravating that people still look up to her to an extent because it's like, she is terrible at this. She's absolutely awful at this. Okay, so moving on. So we do have confirmation as well. Yes, Harry and Meghan did share their baby news at Princess Eugenie's wedding. So they pulled people aside. So Charles in his office at Windsor, Catherine and William, and they told them the fabulous news. And I'm sure they told then every other person at the venue. Every other person knew that Meghan was pregnant by the time they left. And I'm sure that irritated Eugenie and 
Sarah and Beatrice and the and Andrew and all of them to death. And I'm sure the rest of the family members too were like, well, that's great, but you know, this is this is her day. And here's the thing. How would, could this information not have been conveyed another way? I mean, I know they were leaving for Australia, but there were ways where they could have called the family in together and had this discussion without committing the ultimate wedding faux pas, which everybody knows, everybody knows of not announcing a pregnancy, not announcing an engagement at somebody else's wedding. This is basic human etiquette here. I feel like this is a rule no matter if you're living in a trailer park or if you're in the highest castle in the land. Everybody knows you don't do that. Classless, tasteless people do that. People who are obsessed with themselves, those are the people who do that. So I feel like Harry and Meghan actually confirming this and I'm like, awesome, you guys are, are how, do you, how do you guys have friends? I don't how does he even hang out? Well, they don't have a ton of friends anymore. That's the answer. That's the answer. All right. And so this one is rather serious. And this one, again, takes almost takes the cake for ultimate stupid. And this is Harry admitting that he killed, allegedly, 25 people in Iraq or Afghanistan. And he says this and he mentions the terrorist force that he was attacking. And of course now they've made statements calling for Harry to be basically dragged before a war tribunal. He has put a massive target on his family's backs. Why? Why did you need to tell us the actual number? And I thought it was weird that Omid Scobie was trying to defend Harry because all of a sudden he's like, crap. He hardly posted anything yesterday, which I thought was really hilarious because all these tidbits kept coming out and it makes Harry and Meghan look really, really bad. And he's trying to defend against, well, look, all the papers way back in the day, they all said how great it was that Harry was fighting on the front lines. So I was like, that's not the issue. The issue is he gave it an actual number. Vagueness would be king here. Why would he give an exact number? He doesn't need to do that. That's something that's best left unsaid because what it does is it puts a giant target on his back and people who want to hurt him and his family go, hey, look, this dude actually killed 25 of us. Let's make him suffer 25 times over or whatever. It's so idiotic. Like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It's just so utterly crazy to me. He should have just left the, the mention vague. He did not need to actually, he could have said, yeah, I did kill people in the line of duty and just leave it at that. Why include a number? Now, I feel like a lot of people are positing, and I think this could be true, is that here he wants his internationally protected person status back, which means that basically anywhere he goes in the world, he gets that government's protection augmented to him. So, for example, in the United States, if Harry and Meghan lived here and had international prote internationally protected person status, or IPP, my government would be paying to augment their security. Utterly, utterly ridiculous. But I feel like Harry and Meghan want that back. And they wanted it to begin with. They, they mentioned it in their Mexit, leaving their whole statement on their website. They mentioned this, that they wanted that status. And they want that status, I think, because they realized that, hey, covering full-time security, it's hecka expensive. So what do they do? They want to augment it with my government's taxpayer money and the UK's government's taxpayer money and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and Mexico and wherever else they want to go. They want that security apparatus. And what's utterly idiotic is that, A, I don't think revealing this number, if you are stupid enough to reveal this number, I don't feel like that stupidity should be rewarded, A. And B, you've made it harder for your own freaking security team. Why? Without the guarantee that you can get that status back. It's just fundamentally dumb. It's, it's dumb. It is so, so ridiculous. It's, it's just, to me, it's like, I, I can't even put into words how ludicrous that idea was. <laughs> like somebody should have told him, hey, leave it vague. What does it add for you to actually say? And we don't need to know all the, we can, we can guess that he's dealing with a lot because he has killed people. And I've heard a lot of people have mentioned in the comments, I don't really have a ton of members of my family who are in the armed forces, so I can't say, or who were actually in combat, but they generally don't reveal the numbers. They don't go into specifics. They generally try to keep this stuff somewhat quiet. So I don't know how it helps anyone. And the troops he's supposed to be supporting with the Invictus games by like revealing this number. I'm like, why, why? 
Next says, we knew way too much about Prince Harry's penis. I don't need to know that he's circumcised. I don't need to know that he had frostbite once there on his, his parts. And I do not need to know that he was ridden like a stallion and that's how he lost his virginity. I don't need to know that. Why they would think, Harry and Meghan would think it's okay. Now, I don't realize Harry re wrote the book, but Meghan, I'm sure, reviewed it before it went to press. I, I am absolutely certain of that. Why do we need to do that? I don't care how he lost his virginity. I don't care. If he's cut or uncut, why, why would I care? The only thing that makes it somewhat, you could almost say interesting, is that I always thought it was that both of the boys were uncircumcised because Diana apparently did not like the practice. So, but we did not need actual confirmation, especially because Harry told that about William. Harry revealed that intimate detail about his brother. Like, why? Why? It's, it's something best left unsaid you don't need to say it you don't need to publicize it just keep it to yourself bud keep it to yourself in, in in multiple ways there all right drug admissions harry took cocaine mushrooms and marijuana and apparently at corning cox's house of all places he took the shrooms and the cocaine and the marijuana and was drinking so bravo he, he's a he's a winner there there was an article i think it was in the times saying how harry in the stupid memoir basically convinced her that maybe she should be a republican yeah that's about right. And also it makes Harry look like, and, and the thing is, is that does like, I just think to my mind, does Harry realize if that his, if the monarchy goes away, his title goes away and then he has nothing. So what is like, what is Hollywood going to do if their titles go away? They're going to be like, ah, oh, see, I wouldn't want to be ya. That the title is the only thing that makes him relevant. So, but anyways, even Police officers are like, hey, don't make these shrooms sound good. Like he was, he was saying that they revealed to him his truth. It's like, you were high. Your high does not reveal the truth to you. Self-reflection, introspection, that can reveal a truth to you. Taking shrooms and having a mystical experience in the toilet is not revealing your truth to you. That's not gonna reveal the truth to you. I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit about the toilet bit, although I think I read somewhere something about a toilet bit. Anyways. Again, again, N no, no. All right, so big reveal. The biggest of all, Kate and William guys, they were Suits fans. And when Harry introduced Meghan to them, or told them that they were, that he was dating her, they're like, F off, really? Oh, Meghan Markle from Suits. And not only that, is Harry was like, oh, I'm relieved. I don't have to worry about them judging her because she's an actress. Now they'll want her autograph. And I'm like, that story to me seems like complete and utter BS. Complete and utter BS. I feel like if, if Catherine and William were familiar with her via suits, why wouldn't they ever share that? Why, why would they never share that? That's, that's an interesting anecdote of their relationship and their bond and stuff. Like, why wouldn't you mention that? It just seems like lunacy to me to all of a sudden reveal hey they were huge fans of suits and harry was worried about them bringing over their autograph book when they met her and being so stunned oh, it's Meghan markle <laughs> sorry that's just that's so over the top but that's how i feel when i read that i'm like i really don't think they were like clamoring to meet her although i do wonder and this is my theory i've heard that her character is really really grating and people either love the character or absolutely hate the character and so i wonder if they were like we watched that sh they watched that show and they're like yay they, they picked the most annoying actress on the whole thing awesome harry that's that's great so anyways it could have been either or but i honestly i really don't think they were fans i don't i don't think so because i feel like this would have come out at some point it would have been an interesting note it would have been something catherine william could talk about with their relationship is that they did like it we know i believe they've watched game of thrones they watched downton abbey so we know some of what their tv habits are so i feel like that would have been a, an interesting bit to share I, I would have been like oh yeah that would be awesome so that they didn't share that i feel like is really really key that it's harry sharing that so apparently harry and megan had Ikea stuff and ordered a sofa from sofa.com when they were living at Nottingham College and they just really absolutely hated it there. 
I feel like Harry and Meghan again had these delusions of grandeur and they wanted what Catherine and William had. So apparently they went to tea or dinner or something at Catherine and William's and they're walking around apartment 1A going, Dude, there's priceless art on the wall. There's all these antiques and everything. And here we are with our thrift store, Ikea and lamp and sofa.com sofa. And honestly, the pictures did look pretty barren of Nottingham Cottage, but you gotta think, I know that the ceilings were low, but you know who also lived there? Catherine and William. And Catherine and William are both taller than Harry and Meghan. Catherine is about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and William is 6'3". So, Harry is 6'2", and Meghan is probably 5'6". So, Catherine and William, taller, lived there for, I think, about a year and a half, two years. Now, they did have their state in, um, they did have Amner Hall, and they did have the place they rented out in Wales while William was working as a search and rescue guy. But Catherine and William also lived there, and I think either Beatrice or I think Eugenie lived there for a period of time. So a lot of people have lived there and yes, it's not great, but this idea that they were expecting what Catherine and William had, they were going to get there. The, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester were moving out of their home, which I think was apartment one. And William, sorry, and Harry and Meghan would have moved in there, most likely, if things had worked out the way everybody intended. So apartment 1A is bigger. I don't know why apartment one is not as big as apartment 1A no idea but the duke and duchess were moving out so harry and Meghan would have moved in and they did eventually get frogmore cottage but they wanted like a whole wing of windsor castle they wanted or maybe even it's been rumored frogmore house itself so they wanted very very grand locations for themselves and the palace is like no no you get nottingham cottage and we do have a really cute picture of catherine and william with george so they lived there for a period of time with george so there were three people technically living in that house, which is only two bedrooms, I think, and maybe one bathroom or something. It is very small and it's absolutely small. Let me grab the dimensions here. So it's 1,324 square feet. So it is small. So Catherine and William used Nottingham Cottage as their London residence between their marriage in 2011 and to 2013. So they lived there for about two years. Now, granted, again, they had other homes elsewhere or other places they were staying, but that was their London base was Nottingham Cottage. And then Prince Harry moved into it and it was his bachelor pad and then Meghan moved in and then they moved to Frogmore Cottage. And then it was reported that Beatrice and her husband, Edo, would be moving in there, which could make sense because now they have a place in the Cotswolds. And so that's probably gonna be mostly their base, but they'll need a place in London. So that, that would be a cute little place. And I'm sure Meghan in her mind, she was envisioning this grandeur of this, like she would have an entire wing of a palace to herself. And she came in to this, you know, stooping and hitting the top of Nottingham cottage and she was like what the heck is this and she's like holy heck I thought I was coming into a palace and here I am in this little itty bitty space and granted she dated Harry while he lived there but I'm sure she was expecting immediately to have some grand place set aside for her and they were working on that but it does take time and they have to a lot of these places they're lived in for a while and then they need refurbishment for the next person because these old buildings take a lot to maintain so that was just the easiest option the next is that I feel like Harry really despises Catherine for taking his brother away which is normal part of life. So I don't understand quite where he's coming from. So when William married and he walked out of the church, Harry, I guess, thought to himself, you know, he was wishing him by. And it's the way I've heard it read and stuff, it seems very melancholy and very sad. And I, I think it is sad to lose, you're not really losing a family member because you are technically gaining one, but you are losing that dynamic that you had. And so Harry was really mourning that loss, but I feel like he's mourned it too much to the point where he, to a certain extent, resents Catherine for a natural role she had to fill. Good marriages, marriages that last a long time, the person that they marry becomes their best friend, they cleave to one another, and they are one flesh. And so Catherine and William, I feel like really do exemplify that is that William was no longer leaning on Harry the way he was. He was leaning on his wife as he should have been. William, once he married, should not be palling around with Harry all the time. Now, of course, 
spend time together absolutely but i feel like some marriages the guys just they marry and then they, they they basically live the life as they did before which i feel like is what harry wanted but william i feel like is a mature guy and he was excited to be married to Catherine. he wanted to be married to her and they wanted to create a life together and so what do they do they spend a lot of time together harry's not going back and doing basically all the things he was doing when he was before he officially married. He and Catherine are creating a unit together. And I feel like Harry really, really resented that. And to a certain extent, yes, you do feel sorry for him, but you're also like, come on, Harry. That's what good marriages do is they they come together and they, they they focus on each other. And one great example of Harry's, I think, ridiculous jealousy over this. Obviously, when William got married, him and Harry went and greeted the crowds. They stayed together the night before and they went together. So they had this very much this bonding brotherly moment. But that moment was meant to be at that specific time because it would never be the same after that. It would never be the same. So you have this one moment to to live with yourselves together before William goes off marries his wife, and they become a couple, they become a unit, and that brotherly bond is not severed, but it is to a certain extent separated, because William needs to be with his wife. But Harry, in his mind, was like, well, that was a tradition, so it's my wedding. I want my tradition, so I want you to stay here with me overnight, have dinner, go out and greet crowds with me and everything, and William's like, I have a three week old baby at home. I have my wife at home. I have two other children at home in addition to that. We have to get up tomorrow, get ready for a wedding that might be viewed by a billion people. So I cannot come and play with you bachelors anymore. And again, it's that thing where it's like, so my sister is probably gonna get married before me. So if she gets married and let's say we do something similar, I wanna expect her to do it for me because that was our moment as one family unit together. That was our kind of last hurrah in a way because the family dynamic is irrevocably changing and she's going to go and she's going to be a family with her husband in addition to hanging around our sphere. And so I feel like, again, Harry's jealousy and resentment here, to a certain extent I get it, but it also feels like he is five or 10 and frustrated that his brother who's 25, 26 is no longer playing with him. That's what I feel like is that Harry's request to a certain extent is so juvenile and so out of touch. He just looks like a very juvenile, almost kid begging for things to go back to the way they were. And it's like, no, William's family, his dynamic has changed completely and Harry's just not there. But exfit, seals. Megan communes with seals, guys. She talks to them, they talk to her and it's magic. Let me read you it. Because if it wasn't so ridiculous, you would almost not believe it. And it's like, why even put this pen to paper? The Duke of Sussex recalled in his memoir that he received two signs that he was going to be a first time parent. The first one came when he and Megan, 41, were in Scotland and stumbled upon a group of singing seals while boating. Harry remembered his wife singing to the animals who he claimed sang back. She really is magic, I thought, he wrote in his book. Even the seals know it. And it goes on to say, as a seal opera continued, the prince decided to count the moment as a good omen and stripped down and jumped in the water with killer whales. That's, that's how that story goes. Uh, I almost don't have words. Like, yes, sometimes you, you talk and interact with animals and they do their thing back to you, but it's like, it's, it's animal mimicry. Like I have a dog and she's sleeping on my bed and sometimes we, we fake howl to get my dog to howl and she does. She, it takes her a while to get there and she's very, very squeaky when she does. But we can get her to howl, but it's just so supposed to be fun. I'm not like looking into anything deeper. Like I want to hate when somebody goes, oh, she's so lovely. Her dog howls with her. I'm like, no, that's so cringy. That's so cringy. I'd want him to go, oh, your dog reacts to you. You're, you're like, I would want them to know that like when I pick my dog up, she leans into my chest. That tells, that should tell people more of perhaps that I'm a good I don't know if I'm a dog owner. I guess I, I don't know where I'm going with this. Anyways, yes, special bonds with animals are special, but Megan singing and having an opera with a group of seals makes them sound like loons. It really does. And it gets, it gets cringier from there. So apparently Harry took Megan to his mother's gravesite and he left to go back to his house for some moment. And he came back and Megan had her hands on his mother's 
on his mother's grave marker. And she said, so Harry saw Megan on her knees with her eyes closed and her palms flat against the stone. And she asked for Diana for clarity and guidance. Well, you can't ask her for clarity and guidance because she's, she's, she's not there. Like Megan can't actually commune with your mother. It's like, it's almost like you feel like he felt like the spirit of Diana entered Megan because they're so obsessed with the Diana comparison that it a refuses absolutely to die. They, they keep dragging it up again and again that Megan is Diana, Megan is Diana, Megan is Diana. And it just falls completely flat. And it honestly, they just sound, if I came across somebody going, I'm trying to commune with your dead mother, I'd be like, yeah, no, we're done here. We're, I, I, I'm not doing, I'm not going into that stuff. But Harry through this whole thing and a lot of this stuff is sounding more and more hippy dippy. Like there was another story that he heard from some like clairvoyant woman or something. Oh, Archie broke, Archie broke a Christmas ornament that was given to him by his grandmother. And this, the woman knew this and I'm like, oh, cup, give me a break. So sorry. I'm not into any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So Harry just doing all that. I'm like, really? And that you were really that, you know, convinced by Megan to, oh, for Pete's sake. All right, baby brain. Yeah, so Megan Markle, the woman who created a podcast called Archetypes, which is supposed to push against the stereotypes put on women, uses a stereotype against her sister-in-law. Yes. Oh, yeah. In the lead up to Harry and Megan's wedding, Catherine apparently, she was just postpartum. Apparently, she forgot something, and it was a minuscule detail. And Megan chipped in that she had baby brain because of her hormones. And Catherine was deeply offended by that because... A, in the royal family, we don't talk about other people's hormones, which I'm like, bravo, nobody really needs to bring that up. So I'm sure there was no really PMS talk in the, the palace in terms of somebody going, oh, you're just hormonal. I don't, I would imagine that doesn't happen. But perhaps that would happen within immediate family members, but not somebody marrying in going, oh, you just have baby brain because of your hormones. And Megan tried to pass it off with, ah. I tell my girlfriends that, but like, honey, you're not with your girlfriend. You're with your sister-in-law. You're in a different country. You are meeting different people. Like Meghan Markle, like she just sounds dense. She just sounds like an incredibly dense person. And so up on herself that this normal thing of trying to gauge what somebody else thinks is so either beneath her or beyond her that she can't even do it. She can't even do it. And it's just the simple thing of taking a moment and realizing that Catherine, yes, she had, she just had a baby, but you are not familiar enough with her to tell her that. And William called Megan out on it. And apparently there was some confrontation and William did apparently stick his finger close to Megan. And she's like, well, get your finger out of my face. And you could just feel the attitude there. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I'm sure Catherine and William were just deeply frustrated by this bullheaded woman who would refuse to acknowledge any of their concerns, their thoughts, and she would just barrel through and just be incredibly rude to them without considering them in the slightest. And it's like, well, I thought Megan was supposed to be this grand person who knew everything and who was so kind and genial and everybody loves her. And it's like, you couldn't even get along with the basic family members by amending your behavior. All Megan had to do all Megan had to do was amend her behavior and she refused to do it. She refused to change up her behavior, to adapt to her new surroundings because she was so convinced in her own mind that she, everything she does is a hundred percent, a hundred percent fantastic. It's just so, so like, it's just shocking really how dense and dumb she comes off. All right guys, so this is actually another point that I'm actually refilming because later I, I completely realized I miss a crucial, crucial aspect of the story. And so this was the story about the bridesmaids dresses. So we've heard a cadre of different stories about the bridesmaid dresses. We've heard it's pantyhose. We've heard it's, now we have like the issue with timing and fit. I've heard the fit before and I've also heard to the worst extent that there was bullying involving Charlotte and particularly one story that I heard. Now granted, these, this is just in Tumblr sphere somewhere. I've heard it repeated in a couple other channels, so take this with a grain of salt. But the worst extreme version of the bridesmaid stories that I've heard is that 
they were basically calling Charlotte fat. And I think this story, to the detriment of Harry and Meghan, somewhat confirms that. So basically what happened is Catherine got Charlotte's gown. And Catherine, you gotta realize, is a couple weeks postpartum. I'm sure she's stressed. She has two young children. She has a new baby. And so they're getting used to all these different things. And now they have this giant wedding to plan for and, and be in that'll be watched by millions of people. And Catherine, of course, she's very aware of her children's looks in terms of she always she's aware of the fact that her children will look back at their photos years from now. And she wants them to have a good image of themselves, I think. She wants them to always look impeccable in front of the public rather than looking messy or something like that. She really wants them to look back and look fondly on the pictures of themselves and have their pictures, because they'll be recorded throughout history, look good. So, bravo to Catherine there. So she gets Charlotte's dress, which is horribly baggy. It's huge. It's just messy. It's a disaster. And again, Catherine, couple weeks postpartum, has young children freaking out about this to such an extent that she calls Sarah Burton, the woman who made her wedding gown, asking her what to do about Charlotte's dress because she was so freaked about it and she was so stressed about it. And she told Megan, this has to be completely redone. And Megan says, well, yeah, come into the tailor. And I think Catherine to a certain says like, no, this is horrible. This is unworkable. You need to completely revamp this. And it was a couple days before the wedding. And granted, I understand that I'm sure Megan was under some stress as well, but I also think Givenchy comes across this looking utterly terrible, utterly terrible. They're terrible at this. But as far as we know from the excerpts we have, we don't know how the other bridesmaids girls dresses looked if they were as horribly constructed and made as Charlotte's was and even on the wedding day itself you can see that Charlotte's hem is totally uneven it looks like they literally sewed the dress together as she was like in the car ready to get to the event and so when I'm looking all that too but what really comes across to me is that so this dress was horribly baggy terrible Charlotte put it on burst into tears. And so Catherine's very desperately trying to get this redone. And I think there was a clash over that and a deep frustration from Catherine's part that something as simple as a child's dress could not be well made by a French couture house, which is actually absolutely insane when you think about it. Child dresses are simple to make because they haven't gone through puberty yet, so they don't have hips to deal with, they don't have a, a developing bosom area to deal with. It's, so it's, it should be a very, very simple silhouette compared to dressing a woman. So the fact that Givenchy apparently could not fit dresses to me is just insane for children is absolutely insane but the real thing is is that Harry and Meghan whether or not they know it actually confirmed to me to a certain extent the stories that Charlotte was bullied and that maybe she had been called fat and the reason I say that is because she got a big dress the dress was too big and I'm sure she put it on in front of everybody's in this horrendously oversized dress and she was made to stand around while the other girls maybe giggled laughed you know Megan who already called Catherine baby brain for being for having overwhelming hormones could be along with her friend Jessica Moroni because Jessica has also been dragged into us as well as Jessica's daughter Ivy could have been making fun of Charlotte because her dress was too big and I just think, why would you confirm the worst case scenario for me? I mean, this is just my opinion. Take it for what you will. Confirm for me that the worst case scenario with that dress did happen. I think it did. I think it totally happened that way. And that to me is just utterly shocking. It's shocking that that went that way. And that Harry and Meghan would essentially confirm that, confirm the rumors in a roundabout way. It's just like, did you guys not think about how this would go through? But I think, again, part of the problem with Harry and Meghan is this book and every interview they do is a way to push back against the narratives that they hate about themselves. And so they have to come up with a different explanation of things every time or a different version of the story. And apparently Meghan was down on the floor crying, but I'm sure Catherine was very upset. And again, Catherine is like, I, I didn't have this problem because I think if I remember correctly, Catherine used a, a service that designs gowns just for children. So they do children's bridesmaids dresses. That's all they do. And even though her dress was designed by Alexander McQueen and there was a connection between those two businesses to make sure that the dress is all coordinated, the only dress of the bridesmaids dress that Alexander McQueen made was Pippa's. The other ones were all made for, for, by companies that make 
dresses for children. So Catherine, I'm sure, was probably like, I told you to reach out to this kind of company instead of having Givenchy do it. And Givenchy, I think, throughout the whole thing looks terrible they could not dress a princess correctly and Meghan Markle also I think looked awful in her very dull and boring and uninspiring dress that was horribly fitted it could have maybe worked if it had been fitted well but then Meghan's hair fell apart her veil was too big and it didn't work the meaning behind it was just dumb to me it was just idiotic her, her the meaning behind her her veil is that she had all the Commonwealth flowers on there because, you know, she's the vice president of the Commonwealth Trust. And it's like, well, the only person who actually, the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, and but the only person who had the flowers of the Commonwealth on her dress at one point was the Queen for her freaking coronation. So that gives you the, the level of grandeur and delusion that Meghan had. And apparently my sister was reading this to me, is that, Di that Meghan really wanted, I think, to wear Diana Spencer tiara. And so she designed her veil essentially to mimic some of the look of the Spencer tiara. And I think maybe Harry's, to give her the benefit of the doubt, maybe one of Harry's aunts kind of jokingly said, well, maybe you can use Diana's tiara. And Megan was like, oh, yes, yes, yes. But who holds the tiara? Why, it's Earl Spencer. Earl Spencer holds the tiara. And he's not as close to Harry anymore because in part he didn't like Meghan Markle and tried to turn him off of her. So this idea that Meghan was gonna wear Diana's tiara, Diana's wedding tiara, yeah, it wasn't gonna happen. But if you think about it too, Di Megan did choose a tiara that somewhat resembles what Diana wore. So you just gotta think of it there. But anyways, that is just a story where I'm like, why would you confirm my worst case scenario about the bridesmaids? That's just crazy to me. But again, this, this book apparently is not to make them look good. But again, I don't know what it's for otherwise. Money, of course. So this was another thing where Harry just took the completely wrong thing from this. Now, what's interesting, I feel like, is that Harry said that Charles told him he couldn't afford Harry and Meghan. And Harry twisted this into the fact that Charles was so insanely jealous of the effervescent Meghan that he he said this to try to push them down because you know they, they weren't able to dominate the monarchy like they wanted to. And I was like, well, A, Harry, you can't dominate the monarchy, neither can your wife. And B, I really think it's not that Charles was upset about them upstaging and he's had that from Diana, from William and Harry, and then from Catherine. So Charles has had this for a long time. This is not something that's new to him to be outshined by another member of the family. He's dealt with this, this ent his entire life pretty much. So at this point, he's used to it. So I don't think they're as threatened as Harry and Meghan were thinking. What I think the monarchy was frustrated by and identified is that Meghan Markle wanted to dominate things rather than working within the team environment that the monarchy is. So, and it's just that, so Harry twisted it. And then what I think the real thing is, is that I think Charles probably told Harry at some point, well, I cannot afford to buy your wife a $75,000 engagement dress every time she wants to go to a gala event. I can't afford to spend $75,000 on that, nor can we afford to spend $800,000 in one single ugly maternity dress that she will only wear one time in Morocco. We cannot afford to pay ridiculous sums of money to satisfy, satisfy Meghan Markle's ego. And I feel like that's probably where Charles was coming from. Charles was like, I cannot afford to pay for Meghan Markle's obscenely expensive taste that you seem to not be able to rein in. That's the issue. And when it comes down to it, I feel like what spare is really is a gigantic tantrum that Harry doesn't understand the difference between the heir and the spare dynamic and general sibling rivalry. Yes. So brothers and sisters, they're rivals. That's the natural progression of life. So Harry apparently was very jealous and frustrated that when William got married, him and Catherine got more cars, more staff, more offices, more opportunities. And it's like, well, A, he's, he is the heir. He is the heir. And B, he's married now, so he needs to take on a more official role. This, this should be rather obvious to Harry. And then we also have this anecdote where Harry was upset that William got a better room at Balmoral than he did. And at, growing up, I can tell you that in every family I visited as a child, as another child, all the older children got the better rooms. Yes, they did. My One of my friends, her she had two brothers, and so her two brothers, they had to share a bathroom, whereas she got her own one in her room, which was a big deal at the time for me. And 
Another friend I had, she was closer to the bathroom. So technically she had the better room and perhaps the bigger room. And so it's like, and in my family, I got the room with the very, very nice view. And my sister got the one that wasn't as nice. Although she got to avoid like the heat that came into my room and the terrible windstorms we had. So she got up somewhat better in terms of sleeping at night. But when it came to the view, I had a fabulous view growing up. I had an incredible ocean view. It was awesome. So but that's just general family dynamics. So here he misconstrues this into thinking that he's being put down because he's the spare. And it's like, no, 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 you are the second son child. The firstborn generally gets elevated. They just generally do. And I was talking to my mom about this and she's like, well, and also firstborns are required to do different things than their younger child. So for example, once a the oldest child turns 16 and has their driver's license, when did you know it? All of a sudden you're shuffling your younger siblings around. And also as well, I felt like when I went through school, I was like the guinea pig. So I would just go through classes. And then when my sister would come behind me, my parents knew how to navigate things better because I went through it first. So this idea that Harry is conflating and confusing the air and the spare dynamic with just gen what generally happens between siblings, I feel like is so, so key here. And that's why I feel like Harry just comes across one, like again and again as a rather dense, dim guy. And I just feel like him and Megan, especially looking through all these different things together, I feel like they come across looking like the village idiots. Megan comes across as uncultured. She comes across as brash, rude, demanding, unyielding, bullheaded, that she cannot amend to other people around her, that she cannot amend to another culture. And here he comes across as just dim, really dumb. He <laughs> seems to be confusing everything and talking about drugs and psychedelics and all these sorts of things. And I'm like, so what was the point of this book? Because generally a memoir, although you do are required to pull back the curtain and share some of your deepest and most trying times, which I'm sure Harry does. And again, these are just snapshots and tidbits, but it's supposed to make you look good. You guys both come out of this looking worse than you did before. So what was the point? And how did Megan not catch this? It's one thing for Harry to write this, but me as if I was Harry's wife, I'd be mortified that my husband was apparently so stupid that he did not understand that people were playing a joke on him when it came to a German uniform, perhaps, or that he went ahead and worn it, even though they were sarcastically kind of telling him no, but said yes, under the impression that he would be smart enough not to do something so insanely stupid. And so I'm like, who's dumber here? I feel like it's dumb and dumber. The question is though, who is dumber? Again, Harry for writing or Megan for letting her husband look like a fool and herself for looking like a fool on the international stage. So guys, let me know what you think of this video. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.